If you ask that to my question, uh, my children, you will get the very simple answer. Like my my daughter would say, in any insect, spider, or literally, I'm the I'm I'm quite res well respected. Whenever there's a spider in the house, and I'm the only one who can catch it, right? And if you ask my son, is a missing screen time or right? not being able to do any internet? That's his biggest fear. Oh, I've long, I mean, lived long enough now. I'm turning 50 next year. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, yo. Yeah, I know, I know. It's, uh, I don't look it, but yeah. <laughs> but I, now I don't, I'm not afraid of a spider or screen time. And, and, and I, I'm not those kind of thing anymore. But there were times, or maybe still somewhat right now, even now, there are a few things if I can name that what I'm afraid of is I'm afraid of an unclear future. You know, and I was afraid of my children's future as well. I'm actually afraid of the what they, what if they turn out to be bad? You know, there's a constant kind of a talk with my wife in you know, how make sure it doesn't happen to them. I do think about the church a lot because they, well, that's my job and God has put up on my heart and that thought and concern naturally leads to sometimes a fear. There are things that we are afraid of a lot. And I mean, many things there are, right? But ultimately, if you have really ask this honest question to everybody's heart, that what we are afraid of the most is actually death. If you can overcome the idea of death, you can overcome anything. The reason today is so special is because I mean, there is a fundamental difference between Christian and non-Christians is we are the people who understand the solution for the death. Hmm. Do you know that? Now, I was, my wife is a scientist and we were talking about, you know, there's one of the mystery in science that they couldn't find the reason why we age because our cell, cell always regenerate, right? It recopy, regenerate, right? That was uh, one of the reasons why we, you know, because it always regenerate, how come we're getting older, right? So I don't look like this all the time, right? I wasn't, you know, I was, there was time I was younger, right? Wow, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> And then also the documentary is saying the big reason is because when you when your cell regen like a uh, uh, restore and regenerate and all that stuff, so make a copy, right? But when you make a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, there's a small tiny bit you lose out. Now that small bit, like a ninety, it was hundred percent, and next copy is hundred ninety nine percent, nine 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 nine. You know, and then and that little bit is over the year that actually accumulates, and then it becomes like me, right? And why we degenerate like this? I think the Bible speaks very clearly because that is the course of nature is set before us. After the fall, when we walk away from the, the source of our life from the Bible and we all are, all are under the curse of death. Now, What is the biblical truth on Easter Sunday that we can look upon, we can read on and contemplate about so that we will not fear anymore? And that's the question that I want to answer today. What is the biblical answer to this fear on this, especially on Easter Sunday? So can you all open Bible, John 20, verse 1 to 10. John 20. 1 to 10. Have you guys been enjoying my short sermon these days? Yeah? <laughs> wow, no one opposing this. Wow. Actually, there was two guys came up to me and said, Pastor Joshua, can you preach longer? You, you want their names, <laughs> right? You know, throw eggs in there. Sorry. <laughs> but only two. <laughs> All right, John 20, verse 1 to 10. Let me read it to you, right? Now on the first day of the week, that Sunday, right? Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. While it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and other disciples, the, the one whom Jesus loved and said to, it, to them, 
they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with uh, the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothing lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first and also went in and he saw the he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead then the disciples went back to their home amen I'm going to continue and read on a bit but let me just to first take a first this have a little, little bit of bible study can we like you know this is the first day of the week, which means a Sunday, right? The Mary came to the tomb and saw the stone has been rolled away. It's something she didn't expect. It. So she ran to the Simon, the disciples, and saying, hey, someone took the Lord out of the tomb. She immediately concluded the, through the scene that something happened, supposed not to happen, but only way she can understand is a natural level. She couldn't understand it as a supernatural level. The tomb is open. Jesus died. Tomb is open. That means someone took the body. That's the only thing she can think of, right? And she did that. She told Peter. And Peter ran and says, verse 3, So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. I think this other disciple is, uh, um, this is John, because clue is that uh, Jesus loved, right? That's a clue there. And he arrived first, and he stooped to look into the tomb, but he didn't go in. And do you see the fear in him? It's like, a, you know, nobody wants to go inside the tomb because of the dead body in there. Even although he's the one that he loves so much. But the, the, the tomb, the, the, the gate is open. So he just stooped over. But Peter, I love Peter. You know, this guy is so messed up guy sometimes. But he does things like he doesn't really think much. He just ran in. He went inside the tomb and saw this. But the way he describes quite articulate here, right? There's a linen cover lying there, but they saw the face cloth was not just lying there. It's actually folded up. When someone, if anybody takes a body to do something about it, they wouldn't like nicely fold it up and tuck it in. Okay, let's go. You know, they don't do that, right? There's a, is a, that actually explains about there was someone did it very calmly and very calculatively, and there's something, something very thoughtful about this whole scenery. It doesn't really make sense if the thievery is someone stealing it or someone they're trying to make a, like a mockery of Jesus. They wouldn't do it that this way. It's, there's a certain respect in this, right? Someone did it out of respect, took the body. Now, one thing that I'm quite uh, astonished through this passage, verse nine. And why they didn't really think what this was about. They didn't really know why, why it was, uh, what this was all about. Verse 9 says, For as yet they did not understand the scripture. They didn't understand the scripture. Ignorance, right? Ignorance is actually the open door towards the fear. They didn't understand it. That's why they have to be afraid of it. The thing is that the Jesus constantly talked about his death and resurrection. If you read it, John and Matthew, beforehand he predicted, he prophesied, even on the day, like, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, yeah, I know about, you know, I'll, I'll rise, rise up. But somehow they didn't understand the scripture, even it's in the Old Testament, right? As I ask you a question, the first question is that how can we overcome the fear in reference to the Easter Sunday? Number one clue is truth. The Bible says the truth will set Truth will set you free. Amen? If you know what the truth behind 
our life, the truth behind everything that we know, the natural level, that you will not be afraid. See, there's a difference between facts and the truth, isn't it? Facts is that Jesus died on the cross. Is that fact or not? It's fact. It's factual event. Even non-Christian believe in that. There's a historical record on Jesus died on the cross. There was a guy, religious leader called Jesus died on the cross. There's a historical document on that. But truth is interpretation of the fact. Everybody look at the same fact, but people walk away with a different truth from it. Non-Christian will say, yeah, there's a guy who died, and that's it. A criminal died on the cross, that's it. Yeah, that's a terrible death, that's it. He was a good man, but he died, that's probably it. Maybe Muslims that walk away from, yeah, the prophet died on it. And that's, that, that's their factual statement. But Christian, biblical believer, have a different truth. We believe, no, the Son of Man died for your sin and my sin. Christianity is not just blindfolded to the truth, of, uh, to the facts. We are not being naive and we are not just uh, bringing everything under the cup and, and we just deny your kind of uh, groups of people. Faith is not a form of denial, isn't it? Faith is actually putting our heart into the truth, interpretation of the facts. Why we fear all the time? Because we only look at the facts in our life. We only look at the things around us. We only look at the circumstance. Yeah, I know some of you guys lost your job. Some of you guys having marital issues. Some of you guys have a you know, parental issue. You probably have a, your uh, school issue, relationship issue. Some of you guys going through loneliness. That's a fact. You don't have a girlfriend. Yeah, that's a fact. You don't have a boyfriend. That's a fact, right? <laughs> No, no, I'm not kidding about this because some of the people came to me personally, Pastor Joshua, I am afraid that I may be alone forever. Is this what God wants? And I said, hey, don't that perch. <laughs> don't do that, man. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and, I, and she was actually asking me, do you think it's God's will for me to be alone? And I ask, ask her, so do you want to be alone? Yeah, Hell no, man. <laughs> I want to get married. <laughs> it's like, and I don't think God works that way. I don't think that God give you the gift of a, uh, celibacy when you don't want to be alone, right? Then it's not a gift, it's a curse, <laughs> isn't it? And we have a, so much fear. What if it doesn't happen? What if it doesn't happen? What if it happens? All this thing in our life. And you look at it because it's so vivid, so real. It's so tangible. So it brings up the, so much fear in our life, isn't it? Death is one of the greatest reality of humankind. Everyone knows it. You are just ignoring it. That's why the Korean saying is that the, you know, tough guys always saying this, you know, I'm not sure, do you guys understand? You know, it's for non-Korean, sorry. You know, it means basically, the worst thing can ever happen is a death. You know, I'll just do it. Yeah, I can just go. I can, I, you know, I can go to the mission trip, it means that I'll just die. If I die, I die. You know, that, that like a seemingly very bold statement and behind that, actually, I'm not quite sure people who says that really understand what it meant. Because there's biblical truth in there. The worst enemy of mankind is death. If you know how to overcome the death, if you know how, what God has done to this final enemy of the mankind, then you got nothing to be afraid. You got nothing to be fear. Look, if your Bible says, and the Bible talks about 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7 to 10. Paul says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. There's a treasure, it's beautiful things, but it's, it's contained in the jars of clay, the very weak and you know, seemingly very unashaming stuff to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So it's not about clay, but it's about the power that belongs to God. It's about God, yeah? Verse eight, and we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed but not driven to despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body 
the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Amen. See, it clearly says that Christian and the Christian truth knows about your affliction, your perplexities, your persecution. You know, you are struck down. I know there's a suffering there. There's struggles there. There's a there's depression there. There are sickness there. There's a broke up, you know, broken, breaking up, breaking up is <laughs> there. There's a the separation there. You know, there's job losses is there. Is a reality. Christianity is not blinded to that. But you need to understand the truth behind it. Even if you are afflicted in every way, you are not going to be crushed. Even if you're perplexed, you're not going to be driven into despair. You may be persecuted, but you will not be forsaken, struck down, but not be destroyed. The death of Jesus Christ is real, but the resurrection of Jesus, the life of Jesus is a reality as well. That's what God has done on the Easter Sunday. The message to all of us is, my friend, do not be afraid in this world. I know time is painful. I know it takes time, certain thing. You're still probably wrestling to understand why your marriage is struggling and all that. And I have many people around me. But Bible says no. Believe what God has done through the resurrection because this world is not your final destination. Truth. You need to know the truth. Truth will set you free. I'm not, you know, I think I shared this before, but I'll share it again because it's my experience. I can share it freely. You know, a long time ago, I was, um, I had the experience with the death. One of the, like the, the death experience I had is my best friend died when he was, I think, 17, 18. I came to Australia and, um, and, um, and he, because of my, the, the twin brothers, they're twins, they always play each other and they never play with me. It's so like, you know, no, no, I'm not kidding. It's like they don't, they, they don't really think that I'm a, like an important part of their life. I love them. I forgave them. Yeah, anyway. So I grew up with friends. One of my best friends is, uh, honestly, he's like my brother. And whenever I think about Korea, I would go back for him. That was the reason. And then after about seven years, I came to Australia and I got a phone call. And I said, hey, from another friend, I said, hey, do you know Yonghwa? Yeah, yeah, I just talked to him a few weeks ago. He said, oh, well, he died. What, what are you talking about, man? I just talked to him a few days ago, right? He said, no, he died on the construction accident. And next day, I just bought the ticket. I was in university, New South Wales University. I just, who care about university? <laughs> I just dropped everything. I bought the ticket. I flew out. And I saw the dead body in front of me. I've never seen the dead body ever, but first time I lay my eyes on It was the uh, hardest time of my life. You know why the death is so hard? Because the finality of it. How it actually says, this is it. The person that I saw, used to meet, I used to talk to, is not there anymore. See, even though I haven't seen each other, because he was alive, my hope, my joy is that one day I'm going to go back and hang out with him. We're going to drink together. We're going to celebrate together. You know, I actually talk on the phone. The reality that he was there is completely destroyed because that is that final. He's no more. He was that silence in front of me. That I didn't know that ex an experience caused so much grief in me that I didn't know that how much it would affect me. I came back to Australia. I went to Bible college. I got married. I was a pastor. Probably that's where I probably met you and I was doing the ministry then. But suddenly I realized that I was struggling in my heart. Emotionally drained out, spiritually. I know all this theological understanding, but I just can't see the reason to get up. I just couldn't get up and I got up and I started crying. I don't know where is it coming from. And I start to see myself thinking about committing suicide. I know this is not an easy thing to talk about because, you know, pastor, depression is almost something that you should never talk about, not alone on the pulpit, right? And I'm glad it's not Korean church, so I just say it anyway. And one day my wife actually directly rebuking me and challenging me, honey, I think you have a depression. The word depression, I heard it for the first time and hit me. And I put my wife in a, such a miserable marriage 
when you meant to be supposed to be you know, the happiest moment. And I went to see the doctor for the first time. And I, that was terrible and most awful counseling I ever got in my entire life. And so psychiatry is so expensive, you know, what's there? I'm just pouring my ass out, the region, I think I'm sad, I'm traced back and all this stuff. He was just listening, roaring, and he was yawning. <laughs> you know, that I was like, <laughs> He didn't even listen. I, I'm sure he didn't even listen. I'm sure, like, I, I can understand. I mean, here, how many patients here have listened? Like, so many people come and say, like, oh, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Yeah, whatever. You know, that probably was going. At the end of the day, he literally gave me, like, prescription. I could take this drug, right? And never went back. But this one word he said is, stick with me. He says this, basically. Uh, take this drug, you know, once a week. And see me in one month time, right? And I'm saying, I'm going to die. I'll kill myself. But he said, yeah, take this drug. You'll be all right. And he said, but you know, it's not your fault. Right? You go. You know, he said that. I walked away. And I got so offended. I said, I'm not going to go back. And I didn't take the even drug. You know? And I went to the Christian counseling. And there's a lot of process happened. I mean, they got, and they got recovered and all that. But once in a while, what he was trying to do was basically he just wants to slip the truth in my heart. He, he understand what I'm feeling. He understand my circumstance. He understand that my emotional and psychological disorder by saying the truth. This is truth. I don't care what you feel. I don't care how you see it, but this is truth, isn't it? The guilt and shame and the remorse and the, 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 the sorrow and separation and aloneness that you feel is not real. The truth is that it is not your fault. When it comes to the Bible, I think it operates almost the same way. You need to know the truth. You need to depend on the truth. You need to fix your eyes on the truth. What happened to you? What happened to the humanity? What happened to our past and present and future through Jesus Christ rose again from the dead? He just literally saying that there is no more death. No more death for you. So do not be afraid of death and there's nothing to be feared, nothing to fear in this world. You may have struggled here and there. You may be uh, stressed out. You may be afflicted, persecuted here and there. Yeah, that's a fact. But the truth is not, you're gonna, you are not going to be despaired. You are not going to be destroyed because I have conquered the death. Can you say amen? A lot of Christians, you rely upon your feeling. You rely upon the circumstance. When circumstance is good, you feel Good. You some when you feel good, you feel good, and that is the biggest um, what do you call anti faith in a way, isn't it? You know, there's the biggest uh, disbelief because what God is in, I know what you're feeling, but that's not what you meant to be. That's what Bible says. Rejoice! I will tell you again, rejoice always. Rejoice. Joy is not the choice. If you know what Jesus has done for you. You have to declare the joy in your life and just move on, pushing on, fight on. The thing about depression is quite a powerful thing. Although I am truly fully recovered, there are uh, what do you call the residue of it here and there. Once in a while that I wake up, I feel very kind of melancholy and down and blue and for absolutely no reason. You know, you feel like that. Normally, I listen to my feeling and I turn off my phone and I start just watching TVs and I go, leave me alone, right? You know, but I can't afford to do that anymore because I have a wife, I have two children, I have 200 people coming to my church, right? And what do I do? This is what I do. I come back to the truth. Literally, this is what I do. I go to the shower, turn on the shower. The reason shower is really good is because you are so transparent, you're so naked. That's what I meant, right? And the turn the shower, nobody listening. And I declare the truth. I said, in Jesus' name, I will be happy today. I said that. I know I kind of sound corny. But somehow, somehow, when you declare the truth, basically I'm deciding to depend on truth, not my feeling, and feel, then the feeling comes. Feeling follows the truth. 
and I am set free from the feeling that I was going through in. Does it make sense to you? What's the Easter meaning to you, means to you? It's not just another religious like festival that we go through. There is a definite, tangible, real meaning in your life today. Do not live like that. Do not live like you haven't, you don't know God. Do not live like Jesus is not reason. Don't be like that. You are not made for that. God has rescued you through the power of, to the blood of Jesus Christ and that you should declare the truth. The disciples didn't know the truth. That's why they went away. Well, what's the truth? 1 Corinthians 15, 17 to 23 says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And if you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitiful. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen? This is the truth. You shall not die. Through one man death came, now through a man life came. And you choose. Which one do you want to choose? Jesus is our first fruit, and so everything will follow him. If we trust in him, you follow that same trend. So, church, out of all these days, you shouldn't be sad today. To be absolutely honest with you, today is one day you can just walk around the street like a drunken person, drunk by the Holy Spirit. What do you, you can be said yesterday probably, you probably can be said tomorrow, but today you choose not to be said because why? Because the, today is the day that we celebrate our victory through Jesus Christ. Today is the day that we celebrate our, our, our Savior actually gave us a new life and that we're going to be there with Him. That is the truth. That is the truth. Today is the day that you take your eyes off from the factual things around your life, but see the truth behind the facts. Can you say amen? amen. That's what Christian look like. That's what Christian walk like. That's why I, I don't know. I, I, I always have an issue with people worshiping God in half-heartedly. You know, just all waiting for the good music to come in and good music to feel good. So now I'm going to worship in a good lighting. No, no, no. That's not how we do about it. Even if one have a terrible musician, just with the terrible singing, you should be able to sing to God. Why? Because uh, it's truth. It's the truth that leads us. <laughs> I think you guys synchronize that, right? <laughs> Thank you. If you know the truth, you will not be afraid. There's one more thing. I have three things, but I'm going to just one more thing and finish it off. Let's read uh, John 20, verse 11. And let's read on. It's about Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. So all the disciples gone, and Mary stood, uh, stood weeping, crying outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stood, stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. One at the hand, uh, at the head, and one at the feet. They said to her, "Women, why are you weeping?" She said to them, "They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him." Having said this, she turned around, saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, "Women, why are you weeping?" I mean, this Jesus playing with him. This is.